So really to recap is that when we look at these things, these has five demonstrable causes. We're really, you know, he lists eight, but these are these etiologies that you're gonna look for. Those things that can, those things that can, <laughs> Um, you know, basically causes, but it's not the diagnosis. So their diagnosis is not going to be how oh, they have S1 segmental facilitation. You know, the diagnosis is that this person has plantar fasciitis or posterior tib tendonitis. And, you know, within that, you're going to find these are those etiologies that you kind of clip off in your mind that these are the potential sources of what could do it. So anything from, you know, an S1 radiculopathy, which would be, you know, one of our neural causes, you know, uh, tibial branches, uh, you know, neuropathy here. And here you're looking at, you know, is he now we're referencing a peripheral neuropathy versus an S1 radiculopathy, which may be more still going to be a peripheral as a, as a radiculopathy, but it's coming from a more central origin. You know, deep peroneal or fibular neuropathy. So, you know, neurological weakness again. You know, your segmental facilitation gets into and your fast flow and slow flow problems get into what Jim talks about when we're looking at okay, we're here with these neurophysiological processes. And for some, I've always liked the idea that when you see these, you know, segmental facilitation, it can be irritation, you know, within that segment that can cause the segmental facilitation or irritation, let's say at the nerve root, or what I like to think of as radiculopathy light, where you're getting ir irritability and some irritation of the nerve, but you're not quite seeing some of the neuropathic changes that's gonna cause fatiguing weakness, reflex changes, or some of the other things that kind of go along with this. You know, Jim will talk about fast flow and so flow compromises, which is basically that low grade compression of the nerve, whether it's at the foramen or we're looking at a peripheral and a double crush, you know, you get this kind of failure. So they'll talk about the fast flow is more that, that neurotransmitter where you get this synaptic failure and the weakness caused by that where when he talks about slow flow, it's really a concept that talks about nutrition flow through the nerve, where you know is the proper nutrition flow and protein flow in and out of the nerve adequate, which then causes the structural failure of the end organ. So, and then you'll, you'll, classic thing with Jim is he'll ask you basically, okay, how do you, how do you know that it's, you know, you have a slow flow problem? It's like the only way to really determine that is if you see the non-fatiguing weakness and, and some of the other signs of, fast flow disruption in there. So, so slow flow problems, you kind of determine from that. And if you're thinking of the classic gym trick question, he really doesn't ding you up for it, but he just likes to ask it. So if you end up doing any type of oral practical or clinical with gym, it's just a nice thing to differentiate between those two. Reflex inhibition and neurophysiological. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. Sorry? Or no, Jim, sorry, Dave. Can you just repeat what's the difference again between fast flow and slow flow sure you know fast flow i think of like you know the, the substances that make up the neurotransmitter and so you're looking at neurotransmission where slow flow is nutrition through the nerve it's proteins it's the things that help build the nerve up and keep it healthy so if you think of you deprive the nerve of proper nutrition and the structure it needs and the proteins to keep up a healthy end organ it starts to break down so low grade, you can be low grade compression of the nerve can do this over time. And that's an idea that your, your tennis elbow person, your individual, maybe somebody that's had this, you know, neural compromise for a period of time, which decreases the nutrition flow through the nerve and the nerve then, and the end organ then slowly breaks down compared to the fast flow, which would then be, okay, I'm having a loss of maybe some neurotransmitter and some things that would cause those outward signs if you see a weakness. Does that make sense? I know it's a different concept to people. I have a presentation on it. If, if this is kind of something that's hard to kind of get stickiness in that Jim has done, I will dig it up and get you some other things you would read. Yeah, I'll get that for you. And I'm sure Jim has an, I know I have an old presentation that Jim's with it, but I'll also, I'll also go ahead and see if he wants to update that too. But it is again in that family of, I like to think of this in the more general terms of that low grade compressive problem that doesn't necessarily give you the classic symptoms of radiculopathy. Like this individual isn't gonna have the paresthesias. 
they're probably not going to have, you know, their, their deep tendon reflexes, you know, be, you're fully meeting being, you know, clearly diminished. But because of this, this diminished flow through the nerve, you get end organ breakdown and they're not as efficient. And then that tendinopathy develops through, a, through the weakness of the muscle. You know, reflex inhibition and, and pain inhibition, you know, there's a lot been written now about on this on, on the last 10 years. And I think a lot of it's really good. And that when you see reflex and pain inhibition, you know, they kind of lump, like you can have pain inhibition, which develops into reflex inhibition. You could have reflex inhibition, which develops as a, a, a pattern from somewhere else that was peripheral. And again, this is kind of centrally driven. You can think about at the spinal level, but it can also be driven. I think you see more research saying at the cortical level. So if this was, let's say, if I'm going to say this patient is a person with flat foot and plantar fasciitis, and what can happen is, is that you can get cortical remodeling as well of the motor pattern. So they walk differently and they change their gait and you may treat the plantar fasciitis, you work on different you know, things, you're doing all the right exercises, you're eccentrically loading it, they're doing better and they hit a bit of a wall and it may be because their loading pattern has not changed. So they still continue to load the pattern. That's that difference in that that cortical remapping. The, the good research that I've seen done on this was by Ebony Rio and it was on the Achilles tendinopathy, where they basically looked at transcranial stim and compared what does somebody with, you know, Achilles tendinopathy who's, who's somewhat chronic compared to someone who gets better or normal and see where the brain mapping is. And I saw the, the cortex tends to remap a bit. And they found that part of this retraining had to be at a cortical level with timing and they used metronomes and step rates. And they did a lot of it with dancers to say if they can improve their step rate and the cortical drive, that was kind of the missing piece in some of this tendinopathy rehabilitation due to this remapping and repatterning. And, you know, I think we get this in, you know, whether it's your total knee and your older patient, you know, to plantar fasciitis, what we're seeing here, certainly, and as we get into shoulder and shoulder stability, we're looking at that as Jim talks about the weakness in the different muscles and has this person developed a, a gimpy pattern I think the back research really supports this as well. It's the same pattern if you look at Hodge's work with lumbar pain, motor control exercises. They also now get into the cortical remapping that this person is somewhat healed, but their cortical map for a recruitment pattern has changed. So is it happening at the spinal level or versus is this happening at a more at a, at a higher level due to the remapping? So when I see reflex inhibition, in my mind, I break it out you know, in these ways to look at it in these broader concepts. There's an article in, actually the articles that cover this well right in module one of the lumbar in the fellowship reading. There's a, uh, there's a neurophysiological you know, concepts in modern manual therapy, which diagrams it out nicely. And also in like, their Hodges did a summary article in 2019 on like, uh, basically it was a summary of back research. And he'll, he'll give you in there, here are the things we see in the cortical portion that is then talked about in his, uh, his summary. hope this isn't incredibly boring for you. But I just want to kind of give you a bit of the detail so that as you look at people, whether it's the ankle, the shoulder, the knee, the hip, it's kind of these things just kind of flow through your mind is where am I treating? And these are different treatment buckets. I hope what it does is makes your treatments a little bit more in, you know, interesting because you can play with these different things like reflex inhibition or cortical dysfunction. Now I'm in the timing and motor control and doing speed processing with individuals. And you'll see this trickle of PT in somewhere or the other. The other one Jim talked about, that's where I think we were talking about a little earlier is that what was missing in Jim is at the end of that one slide yet, you know, in the, I believe it was the shoulder one where destabilization, you know, he talks about, you know, what weakens the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder and what would be the problems that we see if it's biceps, you know, long head, infraspinatus, you know, supraspinatus, teres minor. And then we have damage to the inert structures, which would be labrum, ligaments, and capsule. So if we go back a slide, we think about, okay, here we have the biceps, infraspinatus, teres major, you know, whether it's the flat foot or the shoulder, in our mind, we think of, okay, well, what, what nerve or what radiculopathy would then lead to weakness in the biceps? You know, what area of axioplasmic flow or I'm looking at segmental facilitation or reflex inhibition, you know, what areas of this would be related to the biceps? Am I seeing, am I seeing that with this one with segmental facilitation, you know, maybe I, maybe I have, you know, quick breaking weakness 
you know, when I when I when I do velocity or your velocity dependent weakness, do I have this going on in this individual? You know, are they you know weak with that? But then I also they have a brisk reflex in the biceps. You know, those things would indicate that I'm hey I'm probably looking at a C6 you know segmental facilitation. You know, oftentimes the biceps. Then I'm going to kind of wrap back around and I'm probably going to check wrist extensions, which is another you know C C6 muscle group. And uh, you generally you'll find that positive. Then, then I'm probably up and wobbling the neck. You're seeing with that. Infraspinatus is harder because there's more overlap. So infraspinatus weakness, you're gonna see a lot. It's a harder one to determine if I, if I see it's inhibited, then uh, I will, sorry, I kept the phone ringing. I can't quite do anything about it. If I see that the infraspinatus is weak, then I, I'm gonna look for these other processes, but I can't quite delineate the level. If it is weak, then I'm going to look for something in one of the overlapping muscle levels. Do I see a triceps or a biceps weakness? Do I see something else that would correspond? Similarly with supraspinatus. Certainly in older individuals, I think external rotation or infraspinatus weakness was kind of really highly associated with tears. So if it's somebody who's in their 60s or 70s and you have weakness and they suspect a tear, I think if you suspect a tear from the mechanism of injury and they're weak there, I think that's it's supposedly highly predictive of it, but I'll have to pull that study out for the, uh, the shoulder module. Let's see, I know a uh, I know it was by Chad Cook in manual therapy. Same thing in Terry's minor. And, you know, Jim now gets into damage of inert structures. I think we see this a lot. This is where I think, like, when we get into the shoulder, I think this is really where it's valuable. And I used it maybe twice this week looking at the shoulders. One to rule out that we had, had anything going on in the labrum or capsule. The other one, okay, I found it in the, in the inferior capsule, is that when we, when we, if we get I may say reflex inhibition or pain inhibition from an injury and it's chronic or we get you know again segmental facilitation or weakness you know what happens is we get this slow breakdown because of stress on the anterior shoulder this could be abnormal motor pattern so when i get an abnormal motor pattern we could talk about it it's being driven but then is this is this that cortically driven individual where they developed a gimpy pattern now they have a, they're, they're, they're riding with their shoulder anterior as they go to try and do things without setting the shoulder. And now I get breakdown of the labrum or capsule or ligaments around the shoulder through slow, progressive, degenerative stress. You know, they could have a biomechanical dysfunction, which may be driving this. So we could look at a, a biomechanical dysfunction in this rare area. That could be it. I'm getting tired of talking here. Which, who's, which fellows do I have out here today? Are they all hiding? Can't see me. Oh, there's Tanner Newberger. I always love the picture. He's easy to find. Tanner, are you out there, buddy? Yeah, I'm out here. You're out here. Let's talk, let's talk about shoulder breakdown and some of the things on the first slide we did. Too. Now you've seen a lot of patients and you and you work with a lot of uh, people who are active. So think about what you've seen in some of the shoulders. And what are the, what are some of the tendencies as we go through this with someone with anterior shoulder pain, you know, let's take it, let's take it off here and kind of using our list segmentally facilitate, how could a segmental facilitation in the shoulder, what would it look like if we're going to get breakdown in the anterior shoulder? And this is broad. You can basically say anything and it'll be correct. So say something. Well, I would say just weakness of, just weakness of the rotator cuff musculature and the level of why that can lead to more stress into the anterior portion. Cool. And then that gets into the next question we'll come to is, okay, why is that muscle weak? Is it naturally weak? Very, hmm? very context dependent. Uh, yeah. It could just, it, it could be that segmental facilitation. It could just be there are different types of movement patterns. Um, so, so you said two things are good. You have segmental facilitation you just gave me. And you also gave me, again, either motor pattern planning or we could look at cortical drive or two different things that could cause it, correct? That you just mentioned? Correct. Yeah, good. So how would you test segmental facilitation in this individual as a cause of degenerative breakdown? Just myotomo testing. Yeah. And then- I haven't seen them in a while. I think that was our game plan. Good. So, okay. So you, you test the myotome and you're breaking weakness, oh. but it's non fatigue. Yeah, I would let the clinician talk to him first. Yeah, I want to schedule him before the appointment. 
Thank you. Oh, sorry. It took me a second to figure out that wasn't your voice, Tanner. So okay, so you, you test it, and how then how would you, how would you confirm it? Uh, could do some dermal thermal testing too. Yeah. Um, and then you could also just easy enough compare it to the other side. Yeah. You know what I end up doing right then once I kind of feel pretty good about it is you know if I feel that then I'll go ahead and treat it right there in the middle of the eval. Yeah, I may go up there if I think it's that. I may go up there and wobble the neck. Now I do this a lot, like in this patient in particular, and this is exactly this patient is that I'll go in there, I'll wobble the neck, and then retest them right away. And I do that because I'm unashamed of myself to be a salesman in that standpoint. Because you know what's cool and really powerful to people when you make them weak, they're weak, and then less than a minute later you make them strong. So I, I always take that opportunity. I don't finish my eval. I don't keep going. If I find segmental weakness, I, I basically go in there. I will try and either wobble the neck or I think it's reflex inhibition around the joint. I'll wobble the joint and see if I can change it. If I don't, it didn't cost me anything. But if all of a sudden they're, they, I improve their strength and I can talk about it with them, I got buy-in. It's kind of like a party trick, which gives me some street credit. Does that make sense, Tanner? Uh, it does, and I tend to do that as well. Yeah, it's just so easy to do with that. So what else? So we have that. You mentioned that. What what now what what other thing in this list would likely cause the weakness? And it doesn't maybe on this list. It could be what you think you what you see mostly. Well, as of right now, I can't see the list. I am driving <laughs> home from a meeting. Got you. Okay. Can you give me give me one other give me one other thing. Tell me tell me about the patients you would typically see. Uh, with this type of typically the shoulder patients I I see are going to be either construction or baseball is what I tend to see most. Okay. Uh, so a lot of times I see more, not necessarily the shoulder, more faulty patterns than either the lumbar or thoracic spine. Okay. And those individuals, yeah. But you, you kind of get the idea. I mean, that's pretty good. Because in those individuals, it's a baseball player. You know, you'll see certain tendencies because of their, their movement patterns. You know, they may have the anterior shoulder because you have tightness of the posterior capsule. You can see that. And certainly, you'll see some of these uh, things, you know, and these individuals, too, some of the biomechanicals, you know, the biomechanical faults that are in there. Like, we already haven't covered this in this list, per se. But it's just nice to kind of, you know, maybe get away from that a little bit and look at these other things that go on there. Hey, Tanner, that's pretty good for her driving and trying to multi multitask. So sorry to grab you there out of the car. But just so it doesn't get too sidetracked, does this make sense how you can use the first list on here and then you can come down to any one of these conditions you find and in the back of your mind, you know that these will be some of the things that you'll kind of screen through as your possible etiologies whether it's, you know, infraspinatus irritation, posterior shoulder, long head of the biceps, you know, tendinopathy, you know, whether I have labral degenerative tears, you know, acute tears are a little different because there's usually a trauma involved. But more commonly, what you may see is capsule and ligament issues or laxity from, and much like what you would see in the hip in that, okay, think of the shoulder joint kind of riding anteriorly on the labrum and the capsule, much like you have an anteriorly centered hip. And if it's chronically anteriorly centered, it breaks down the labrum and it can be a little lax in the anterior capsule, which creates problems. But if it comes from some of these processes or these etiologies that we've talked about above. Any questions on this? If I make no sense at all, also please tell me if I need to slow down or change the approach to covering this. So kind of getting into, you know, what Jim went into in the, the second presentation, and I think that's what he mentioned there is, it's kind of going over conditions and etiologies with this and looking at the uh, different ones. So real quick one here. Let's see if I've Drew out here. Drew, are you out there? If not, Tanner can join you. And we'll just take a look at these real quick.
All right. Drew's logging on right now. Okay. Hey, Tanner. Oh, this will be an easy one. So 60-year-old man, cop is, he's not a police officer. It, it took me about 30 seconds to figure that out. But uh, no, he's really complaining over, it's basically right buttocks pain. So you can see how here is like, if you were to look at this person as a 60 year old man, you know, if he's complaining of right buttocks pain, what would your, what would your H1 be? I think it can't be wrong, it's your H1. Yeah, I'd be thinking more probably like a lateral stenosis referral would probably be like one of my H1s, but. Mm -hmm. Cool, and that's, and that's, that's good. So again, it comes down to then, once you have that, what would what would your questions or tests look like? If it's a question, or what would you test? How would you how would you further confirm that that diagnosis or uh, exclude it? Uh, so, like questioning wise, it would just be like what activities make it worse? Because with mm -hmm. a lateral stenosis, I expect like extension biased activities to be painful yeah. and flexion to relieve symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then what, how about how about your how about your exam? What would your exam be? Uh, looking at um, range of motion, and then I'd probably do some like lumbar PDAs too to see how everything was moving and if it was symptomatic. Yeah, I mean that's kind of be kind of what you do, and you know, what what would your what would be the range of end feels that you might see if you looked at? Let's call it, it's like a right sided. Let's say it's an L L four L five. What would your uh, how would that joint feel likely in this individual? Um, what, well, <clears throat> uh, I guess I'd probably like, would think to probably see more mobility, like an expanded neutral zone. You could. Like the breakdown. You could. It depends. Yeah, it all depends where they are in the, uh, in the, in the, in the course of degenerative changes. So you're saying it's kind of like a level two and the Kirkcaldy Willis kind of scale where it's an expanded neutral zone. Yeah. And Otherwise it'd be, I'd probably have more like a stiff end feel. Yeah. And again, you're right. You can, that's where you keep the open mind. That's perfect. You think, okay, I think I'm going to see this when I see the patient. But when you get the other end feel, it doesn't throw you off. It's like, hmm, nope, I have a stiff end feel. And you know then that this person is probably, what, they're probably a stage three then. Would that be, that'd be pretty normal for this individual that if you progressed further, that you're going to have a bony encroachment on the foramen. Yep. So what's more likely in this 60-year-old? Is it bony encroachment or disc herniation in the canal with the likely ca cause of uh, this right buttocks pain if we have a lateral stenosis? Um, I'd probably be leaning more towards the bony encroachment, I think. Yeah. He's a little, yeah, a little bit older for like a disc herniation. Yep. Causing that. Yeah. The other one, the other one would be likely it's, and again, we can't determine that is that because you lose the disc height as you load the facets, it could be buckling of the ligamentum flavum because it, it stays the same length, it shortens, it buckles, and it can be one of the things that also can do it. But, you know, if we can treat the facet or open it up or treat space, that's something we can do, good. But sign of the buttocks. Have you seen, have you, have you, have you one is, one of you ever seen it? Because I haven't. I have not seen it now. Yeah, and again, he put that number mm -hmm. one, but you know, certainly a 60 year old man, I think why Jim puts it number one, because of the age, it could be pathology, and it takes about, it takes about 10 seconds to rule out. Yeah, I, and I, like when he was explaining it too, that's like the more serious thing that you want to rule out. So it made sense to put that kind of like the front of your list. And once you rule that out, then it's more likely after that. Yeah, I think it's just because it was so easy. Cause you know, that's where it's, it's that, it's that thought process of how it goes. Cause I'm not thinking, oh, you have cancer right away when somebody comes here, but it's just such an easy thing to do. He's have his buttocks pain. It's like, okay, once I look at him, I know quickly that I'm moving on from it. But if I go and bring him and flex his hip up and he's got 90, you know, he gets, to, you know, 70 degrees of flexion and he gets severe pain and an empty end feel, then I know, okay, this is not good. And I, I need, I need to figure this out before I go further in that individual. How about, how about differentiating SI joint from L5S1 or let's say L5, L4, it's a little easier. Still, um, yet. sorry, no Drew yet. Well, oh, you're good. Um, well, obviously, I think Fortin's area would be like the biggest thing for me, like mm -hmm. symptomatic or uh, subjective and objectively. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And then with, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of how I would rule in like the SI stuff from a subjective standpoint. I think it'd probably be, they'd probably also get it with flexion and extension activities. It wouldn't be as clear cut as extension would be an issue and flexion would relieve okay. it. Um, and then from like in a uh, testing standpoint, I would, um, you could obviously do like a Portland test to screen for the SI and mm-hmm. then look more into like the biomechanics of how that's, how the joints move in. Yeah. And if, that, if that's all negative, obviously, um, you want to look at like the lumbar spine, but if you're doing just a quick, I'd probably just like screen the SI joint. If that came back negative, I'd dive a little deeper into the lumbar spine. Yeah. That's kind of it too. It's like, you know, if you have a cigarette, it's going to be raging hot. It's going to, you know, you're going to know pretty quickly. You know, you won't get very, you won't, you don't necessarily need Laslet's test to tell you that. You know, what we'll we're looking for. Oh, like, I, was, I, was talking, I was talking more like the SI biomechanical dysfunction. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've seen people with like sacroiliitis, and yeah, those are pretty easy to, because that's usually the pain with rolling over in bed. And, yeah. Um, it's hot and angry. And and, yeah. Yeah. They don't really talk. Stairs are pretty bad for them. And yeah. Yeah. And again, if it's, you know, with the biomechanical dysfunctions too, the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, you need a little correct tanner. I don't yet. No, I was, I've been kicking around the idea of doing okay. it eventually. I'll it's probably okay. finish the fellowship. And- yeah, I, I would do that just because it's just it's so much, but you can look at that. Like you can release the muscles around there and we can, and remind me if I'm out there, we'll, we'll go over some things we, you can do. And that's what you look at as many times as SI, you can have SI joint compression through muscular compression. Which is, which is, I think, quite common. And then there's also the, the articular dysfunctions, which you'll see. So it's just kind of getting a wouldn't sense. Your, wouldn't, mm-hmm. wouldn't the feel of like the mobilizations be different with that? Like when you're testing the SI, like mobility, wouldn't that, wouldn't those feel different? It, it does. Like a, I think the level of irritability is different too, but many times when it's compressed, you, you can get a similar end feel to me, or I am, I am not as good at discerning sometimes the difference like when the SI joint is twisted like you look at it like a, it's funny it's like I don't see torsions very much when we're talking the other day and then all of a sudden that day I saw torsion you know those feel jammed and it's all faxes and you kind of you can you know, there's like huh, those aren't right the compressions can feel fairly similar to it because you're going to get down the inferior lateral angle and the inferior lateral angle is not going to move very well but the sacral base may move well so with those sometimes I'll, I'll sometimes manipulate first just because you know, I neither neurophysiologically I'll get it to free up or biomechanically I can I can I can get it going better. But I think the acuity of pain is is different. I think the the, the subluxations tend to have a little bit more bite to them, where the compressions tend to be a bit more irritable in the histories that I see. If that if that makes any sense at all. In other words, it's kind of like you see somebody the back subluxation; they're acutely kind of stuck. It's got an irritable and an achiness to it that's quickly relieved the manipulation. Where people with kind of chronically hypertonic muscles are more irritable. It's, it's just a different pain pattern. Good. And let's go to okay, lumbar biomechanical dysfunction. We kind of covered that one. Hip dysfunction. What would you see in a hip in this individual that would create like right buttocks pain? other than everything. Let's talk about an anteriorly translated hip first. Why would an anteriorly translated hip possibly give you muscular irritation in the right buttocks? Well, it's gonna change the length tension relationship for pretty much all like the short external, the short hip external rotators and um, a little bit with the glute as well. So that's gonna put an increased tone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, usually with like the hip, a lot of the hip dysfunction stuff, I, I expect typically when I see hip issues, it's all always groin pain. I don't ever see anything that's yeah um, hip problems coming in with posterior issues, but yeah, it's, I think statistically it was like 27% would have posterior pain with hip, but in the majority of what you do see is groin. I think if you do see a posteriorly, it's usually in the groin and also posterior more commonly than yeah. just purely posterior. Yeah. So coming in buttocks pain, you know, that would be it. And that one tends to have, you know, you'll see your your lateral, you know, your trochanteric tendinopathies 
occurring with this one. And that way, certainly you're going to have, as you just as you had mentioned, because the length tension relationship being lengthening through the external rotators will be under tension and they'll be contracting. So they'll be a little more tonic. So they'll be toned back in there. Remember in chapter five of Pelvic Girls, she talked about this as far as the butt gripper, what they'd see. That's be that anterior translated hip you saw with this external rotator tone that, would, that I, would, I would expect to see. To think One thing I commonly see that deep buttock pain from a hip is with labral tears. Yeah. It's like that sharp, deep buttock pain that they can't mm -hmm. really touch. That's and then great... you get them in a Faber position and that'll recreate it. That's a, that's a very good description of it. Do they generally have groin pain as well or is it more the deep buttocks pain? Typically also that groin pain or that C-wrap sign, yeah. but I would say sometimes it's missing. Um, but it's kind of pathing, you know, it's kind of you hear that pain after you've seen a bunch of them, you kind of recognize it, right, Krista? Yeah, definitely. It's like the, the descriptor is just different than like maybe the biomechanical. Like you can have to think through them, you can test them, but you kind of get this early like pattern recognition that you've developed. They get, oh, okay, I've, I've heard this pain before, especially if it matches with the groin pain. But no, it's a, it's a very good descriptor. Hey, look, another cop, 43 year old uh, woman cop with right anterior lateral shoulder pain. So this gets back into what we did in the earlier one. So Tam, since, since Timmerman's still driving, how you feel with this? Like, you know, let's talk about this with the H1 of tendinopathy. Let's go tendinopathy first. And he's gonna give our AC joint dysfunction. You know, if they have anterior shoulder pain, you know, what are all the potential causes of this tendinopathy that are non-traumatic? Which are on the first slide. So we take this same list and think of anterior shoulder pain. You know, what type of radiculopathy may cause, you know, anterior shoulder pain and tendinopathy. Still you, Tanner, sorry. Are you gonna be like a C4? I don't know. Oh no, uh, like don't don't think of referred. That's not talking about, let's say, your radiculopathy is tough because you're right, it'd have to be a high one. So you're probably, you know, if you're talking to shoulder pain, maybe C4, C5, but let, let's yeah, think but about it. More, of a, more of what happens if we have low grade compression. Let's talk more about, a, Maybe the segmental dysfunctions, uh, reflex inhibition. Um, I, okay, so I guess if you got a, if you have a reflex inhibition at the shoulder joint, it could create like a hypotonicity, and so I mean it could affect the position of the humeral head, mm -hmm. which could be could stress some stress tissues and give you. Um, if you're looking at like a, like a I guess super spinatus tendonitis, it could be it's having to function at a lengthened position, which could make it a little bit more irritable, and you could mm -hmm. develop a tendonopathy. That. Yeah, and you, can you see how like a, okay, let's say if we're looking at axoplasmic flow, we have a low grade compression of the nerve. You know, describe how that would kind of cause it. Um, so I guess like with the slow flow, it could just um, are you talking like slow flow or fast flow or either? Either one. Slides are up there. Just kind of describe, what, you know, with the tendinopathy, how it calls the tendinopathy. Yeah. So like with the slow flow, I guess it, it obviously um, with like the end organ malnutrition there, it could just lead to just like tissue breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, so that pretty much any activity that you normally are doing is, is just going to stress it more and create a tendinopathy there. Mm -hmm. Um with like the segmental facilitation, the neurophysiological weakness, I guess you'd see. I guess I'm getting kind of hung up on what I would see that with. Cause pick a nerve level, the, it, make, it makes it easier. And you can probably pick any nerve level because all influence the shoulder. Yeah. So if we have, um, let's say we have irritation, you know, maybe it's in, if it's in the shoulder, let's say it's C6. So 
So either whether it's, okay, I have a, I have a mild lateral stenosis irritating the nerve and causing the segmental facilitation. If I had low grade irritation somewhere in the C6, you know, region, and then kind of leads to it. And okay, maybe it's happening at the elbow. There's a low grade irritation there that kind of leads to a facil facilitated, you know, C6 segment. And same with C5 could do it. Yeah, because I think it's it's going to affect pretty much like the force coupling of like the yeah. rotator cuff. So then one's going to have to overwork mm -hmm. to make up for that. And that's what's going to end up leading tissue breakdown, especially like overhead activities or anything above 90. Yeah, because you, yeah, you have the rotator cuff muscles, you know, different segments of it working at different times, you know, the on off cycles, you know, that that patterning gets off the 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 you know the the lateral the rotation of the shoulder joint is what will be impacted so your scapular humeral rhythm these things will be you know impaired so you get all these kind of changes that will occur that are very subtle but will then have a slow grade a slow impact you know the loss of control of the shoulder does the head does the, is the humeral head translating anteriorly and that's breaking down the anterior capsule so you can see it's like for all these shoulders like these things they don't change you can kind of go through the same list of things. And if we were talking about lateral ankle sprains, you could literally in your mind kind of roll through these different lists of things I want to look at. And you can see where like reflex inhibition, you know, it's pretty strong around the shoulder, isn't it, Tanner? What would you say? What, it's setting up, it's maybe not reflex inhibition. Let's talk about like motor control or, or change in a cortical drive. What does it look like with shoulder pain? If it's this woman with anterior shoulder pain, what's what's that patient typically uh, look like? Oh yeah, um, I feel like I see that a lot. Um, yeah, like yeah, the scapular humeral rhythm is kind of messed up. Um, mm -hmm. They just have a lot of hard time stabilizing. Um, just like the muscle firing patterns off. So I think um, like I've been seeing a handful of. Um, like where the deltoid fires before the supra, so you're getting like a mm -hmm. um, superior translation of the humeral head. I see that a decent yep. amount. Um, so yeah, it can be kind of a number of things, I guess, depending on like what level, but that's why I've been seeing most recently, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's you think about yeah, that, that classic pattern you see, you know, that okay, my, my motor control, my firing pattern is off. You know, you test strength, they're weak, but they're also hypertonic. You know, it's that, that those classic patterns that, that, that you see with this. And, uh, you know, with this, let's get into, let's get into AC, SC joint. Do you ever look at the AC or SC joint much in this individual? One, as far as an etiology, two, as far as biomechanics. Um, I check the AC. I usually don't um, check SC. I guess I just don't feel super comfortable looking at it. Yeah. I just I understand. haven't been, but. Mm -hmm. um yeah i guess I, I focus primarily more on the scapulo humeral rhythm mm -hmm. and kind of what that yeah. looking like I, I don't tend to think about looking at the sc do we have any yeah. i guess i need to do that a little bit more yeah that's what we'll do like in the next module bit is like i was gonna you know put a section in there so we'll look at acscs you know instead of evaluate but then we'll also look at their influence on like first and second rib and the manubrium and look at just the axis and the spins so we'll, 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 we'll cover that a bit when we get into it, but I agree too, before I did all this, I, I didn't, I ignored the SC because it was easy to ignore. But now I, I give it a little bit more love and I look at it a bit more, just kind of some of the force couples. So, you know, that's the nice thing about this is you haven't done it yet. So my expectation is that you do, but yeah, you can get a, get a sense of it is that, you know, if you have a restriction at the AC joint or, a, a, or an impairment at the SC joint, then it's going to it's going to impact the way the clavicle moves throughout that position where it's going to be elevation and toward the end of elevation like around 150 degrees the clavicle you're going to see the clavicle roll posteriorly kind of like my arm does this if it's my right clavicle i need that and a lot of people you're going to see are going to come up here and then they're going to stop and then the rest is glenohumeral motion without the roll and those are the ones that are going to get more of the impingement or your scapular dysfunctions and pain so it's one of the things i early look at because in some people it's really low hanging fruit and it's kind of important in kind of cleaning up some of the, the scapular impairment is looking at the SC, AC joint, you know, and again, eventually we'll get into the relationship of the first and second rib. Because think about that first rib, it comes in right underneath of a deep to it, 
where it attaches. And if, if you have restrictions or shifts there, it impacts what, how the scapula interacts and then down to the shoulder. So it'll be fun. I, I think that, that's a fun section for me. So I'm, I'm kind of like, ooh, I can't wait to teach that. And I think, okay, just because I like it, don't make it too much, make sure I'm still balanced. But that's, a lot, that's something I, I kind of recently really liked. But that'd be that'd be some cool things to play with. So we're looking at this individual, you know, yeah, you could have a tendinopathy. We get the biomechanical dysfunction at the AC joint, SC joint, you know, that can either be the cause and effect of the motor pattern that we see. Okay, anterior lateral shoulder pain again. Other differential there is labral tear. What do you usually do? What do you like to use for a labral tear, Tanner? You think you have a labral tear? What's your go-to? Um, I've been using O'Brien's more. I'll do O'Brien's and then it like a biceps load too, but that's more specific to like a slap tear. Yeah. I've started using O'Brien a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. I find that really helpful. Okay. It's tricky. Jim loves O'Brien's and I always want to write love to O'Brien so much. Then I went through an old article and found his name on an old article in the O'Brien's test. And then I realized why he loved it so much. <laughs> Because uh, some of the studies show it's not as good. I like it. It helps. I think you just have to kind of cluster in my mind. So I'll cluster those tests kind of like yeah. And yeah, I kind of use a handful and also like mechanism of injury and like pain yeah. complaints and mm -hmm. like that and what they're having issues like performing. I kind of mm -hmm. just cluster all those together. Yeah. And, and what we're going to focus on with, with the, the shoulder lab time is we're going to look at some of the ligamentous stability and the labral stability you know, looking at the anterior, inferior, and posterior ligamentous structures and labrum and kind of learn how to kind of, can we isolate these capsules? I use it sometimes in end range stretching for, if it's a frozen shoulder, I use these as mobility exercises if, when they're in a phase three or phase four, or I, I use these uh, Monday when a guy has a non-specific shoulder pain and just by going through the specific, you know, just capsule, capsule region tests and, and stress tests, is able to come, I can, you can find the weak pocket. It's usually the anterior inferior that's weak. Then you'll have an extra laxity. It was very subtle, but it was this one thing that just, you could find really clearly that reproduced this pain. So sometimes it's knowing what you're looking for. And that's where I hope the lab time comes in is that we kind of, it's time to practice feeling things and learning what you're looking for. Because once you start to feel a lot, even you feel a lot of normals, once you start getting into feeling, then you can better identify the abnormals. So that was one where it was kind of nice because I wouldn't have picked that up uh, 15 years ago, you know, or I just would have guessed what it was. But this time it's like, oh, that's, I can find the, the band of the capsule by doing that. I can see where, whether it's labral tear or laxity in the capsule, you know, that I'm not 100% clear on. But I kind of know he's, re, he's he'll, he should do well with rehabilitation, given it was very subtle and he's not doing anything too uh, outrageous. Again, you know, other H1 anterior shoulder pain he has in here. His H4 is transverse ligament tear, which is stress test. So that's the transverse ligament binding down the biceps tendon. And just stress testing for that for the biceps tendon to see if the biceps tendon is able to roll out of the groove. And we will cover that. I don't believe it shouldn't have been covered yet, but we'll go over that a little bit too. Just can we feel the tendon, you know, relocating and pop out of the transverse humeral groove. We get a couple minutes here for 15 year old boy. Man, he, he's a 15 year old cop. Man, all these people are young. So Tanner, you're on a roll, buddy. I don't think you've been wrong yet. So differentials, talocalcaneal ligament tear, you know, how if that's your H1, how do you test it? Um, I'm kind of blanking on which stress test to use on that one, to be honest with you. That's safe. Um, but yeah, you could have just said stress test it if I would have rolled with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's called anterior. It's, it, you know, it's the most common one that, you know, oh, we're going medial. On the, okay, medial side of the heel. Let me think. So yeah, you have you have the interosseous, you have you have lateral ligaments. You know, what are you gonna do if you think you have a talocalcaneal ligament tear? How would you stress test it? Even if you don't know the name of the ligament. Uh, stabilize the talus and stabilize the calcaneus and stress it. Yeah. Think you would anything. Think about if you're doing a ligament of stress test, 
you know, what it should be is that if it's stable, it should be stable in the closed pack position. Yeah. You know, mobility, you have to do in a mid-range because you're testing mobility of it. But if you're looking yeah, at the, stability. Yeah, the stress that the closed pack. Yeah, we, I think we talked about that with Eric last. Yeah, so many wow. times you get a little lost. Like, oh, man, I, I, don't know, I don't remember the name of this ligament. It's okay. Just think about, okay, what's the closed pack position? And once I get it there, is, does, this, does this system feel stable or is it lax? You can test it in the middle zone to see if you have an expanded neutral zone. That's your first indication. Is okay, do I notice an expanded neutral zone if I'm doing a mobility test? So if you're doing a mobility test, which is a more neutral position, this goes for any joint, then mobility test, like, hmm, I have an expanded neutral zone. Let me do the stability test. And Janet, don't worry about remembering. There's times where I look them up too. So you're saying if there's an expanded neutral zone, that would trigger you more to yeah. look at stress testing? That, yeah, kinda, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. If you think about a lumbar facet joint, you go in there and you're mobile and you're like, oh, this thing's moving all over the place. It's not stuck. First, you're disappointed because it's not an easy fix. But then what you're going to do is you're going to kind of test it at its end range. You're going to do your pavel. So you're going to put it to its end range and you're going to press on it to see, okay, does it still have motion? It's hypermobile. So the same thing with peripheral joints and ligament, and ligamentous tests. So you always think that the mobility test has to be where the joint can move. Your stability test is, has to be in a very stable position. And then do I get excessive motion? So it's kind of a nice way to kind of, you know, think about it. I know it, it's funny, you, we go over this all the time, but I think sometimes we, we forget to kind of break it down into, you know, more simple terms and simple rules. This. So this person had pain, what would the biomechanical dysfunction look like? Don't make it more complicated than it is. He's got left medial heel pain. Um, are you looking for like a specific joint that would be? Yes, yeah, like, so what would likely you know, cause, would, give you pain? Oh, um, you could have like a subtalar dysfunction, biomechanical dysfunction. Yep. Yeah, so, and, you, and how would you test that? Let's say he is stuck, uh, bonus points. The heel is stuck inverted. So, what, and it's stuck inverted at the posterior joint. So which glide would be restricted? What direction would the calcaneus glide be restricted? Medial or lateral? Bonus points. Um, lateral? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. No, if it's inverted, the, the, the calcaneus, being being convex would be lateral. So the, con, the the calcaneus being inverted would lack its medial glide. It is stuck lateral if inverted. And if I have that wrong, please tell me, but I think I have it right. No, I think that's right. So they walk in a room, he's got medial heel pain. I see the calcaneus is stuck inverted. He's not everting when he's walking. Then that'd be kind of what I would look for first. I go right there, I check anterior posterior joint. If there's anything else going on. Again, the other differential he has in here for this individual is, you know, calf squeeze test. You know, is he looking for a tear? You know, is there something else going on? Or is it, I think he probably goes on to talk about it even, I doubt you would have a blood clot here, but he may go there in this, his discussion. Tanner, that was really good. Again, I just want to kind of cover Jim's things. I hope that going over these cases in this way is helpful. Again, Tanner, just the way you went through it was great. You know, it's hard to be put on the spot. So there's, you know, it's always, it's easy when you look at these to come up with them, but to have somebody ask you these questions and go over it in real time, I know how challenging it is. So, but with that, with yeah, that I, think, I, think the, I think the video, the videos that Jim posted, specifically that one was, was really nice to see kind of how like the thought process of like, hey, here would be the different diagnosis and there's a quick way to like go through more for like a bias standpoint Yes. as well. I think that was like super, I thought that was like really kind of helpful. I mean, it's, I mean, you do it every day, but I think it's hearing somebody else kind of talk about how they go through it is like was also really helpful. Yeah, it frames your thought process. 
that's kind of what I was hoping for today is that it helps just to frame the thought process. So you're not just like, like, oh, what am I doing next or am I? It's like, oh, I can develop my diagnosis and then I can just go through all the differentials. And that's often how I use bias corrections. Okay, how can I go back in my notes and tell us the next person that I don't think it's this because I did this test. I don't think that, okay, I think it's a biomechanical dysfunction. I don't think this is a ligament tear because the stress tests were negative. You know, calf squeeze was positive, okay medial side of ankle pain. Okay. If I, if I palpate the posterior tib tendon or loaded, it wasn't painful, you know, doing all that is part of that bias correction. So, yeah, I agree. So hopefully putting this down will kind of help you. These are good ones to, these case ones are really nice ones to review. If you're, I'd say you'd be worried about a practical, but I don't want you to really worry about it, but this frames the same thought process that we generally go through when we do it. But this is also a thought process that I use in clinic. And it makes you, it helps because it gets you to your differentials faster. So it makes you faster in clinic, which is the real advantage of this thought process. And I, hopefully it helps with your confidence that you're more confident in the differential that you arrived at, which then makes you a happier person. And every now and then I'm like, oh crap, I don't know what it is, but I can settle back through this thought process and usually work through the problem and get to a solution. Or I can be really comfortable that I, I tried harder than any other PTs that's probably out there anywhere around me. But uh, 